Hi, good day, everyone. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you all to the Caribbean Act Trails Association's 2021 virtual conference. I apologize that the warmth is only virtual again this year, and we really hope that our usual warm welcome will be back in person in 2022, even if um, not 100%. My name is Simone Brathwood, and I'm very excited to be the host of this year's town hall with, the, with a distinguished panel of the current and future leaders of prominent actuarial associations across the globe. These elected presidents have been or soon will be leading their associations in tremendously unset unsettling and disruptive times. Similar to last year, we will be discussing a few of the topics which not only impact the actuarial profession but are endemic in other professions and general society. As a reminder to our, the leaders, most of our working actuaries in the Caribbean are members or actively working to be members of your associations. So messages from you do matter to us greatly. Um, we have with us today, um, Jan Kars. Well, actually he's not here alive in person. He's the president of the IIA. He has sent his apologies for not being able to be here with us, but I believe he, he sent a recording that we'll start off with first. We also have joined us um, Matt Saker, the president-elect of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries. We will have, hopefully shortly, Mr. John Robinson, our president-elect of the Society of Actuaries. He's having some technical difficulties. I will still, in his absence, take a moment to congratulate Mr. John Robinson. We are extremely proud to see our, one of our own take this baton for the SOE. He grew up in Jamaica, and he was also educated at the University of the West Indies in this region. We also have another of our own, Mr. Kyle Runnan, our own president of the Caribbean Actual Association here. We have Helen Pouliot, the president-elect of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries. Lusani Muladzi, uh, the president of the Actuarial Society of South Africa, ASA, he's joined us again this year for the town hall. And Jessica Leon, the president of the Casualty Actuarial Society. Hello. They're full and um, their full bios are on the Zoom event conference or on the app, so I'm not going to go through them in any detail. The point is that they're the presidents and they'll be updating us on all the, the great work that they've been doing, their associations have been doing. Um, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that last year this town hall was on, held on Barbados Independence Day, November 30th. We pushed back the conference so that we could, um, Barbados would be able to celebrate our Republic Day. And I'd like to congratulate all my fellow Bajans, Barbadians out there in the audience. So cheers to everybody. Um, so down to business. Um, Kevin, I think I gave you a slide with the, the topics. Can you um, put that up? Or uh, Pedro? Each leader was given um, a three or four topics to address. Uh, most of the leaders last year mentioned that 2020 was a, a watershed year where these disruptive trends and challenging societal issues needed to be thought of differently and managed differently. And it seemed to be acknowledged by the big associations that these disruptive trends were real and needed to be addressed. Um, and, and also despite the pandemic, pandemic, it seemed that they were able to mobilize to develop big changes. Hence, the topics here are not really different from last year. We hope for it to be an ongoing conversation from last year, and we hope to hear how the implementation plan is going or any new thinking or any repositioning. And our membership in listening, we hope we can find areas to learn from and potentially tactically collaborate with you on. The, it's I think slide three, we can, there we go, there it is. The specific questions we sent them a couple months ago are on this slide. Um, like what are the two top priorities or challenges being addressed and expected to be continue to have to be addressed for the next two years? The, the common conversation about the future of the actual profession. And of course, we mentioned societal ch challenges. The, the social injustices and the frailty of our global stance to tackle climate change has been very exposed in the recent past. There's also an awakening of social consciousness and inaction is now considered unethical to many. So while no single profession holds the key to change in systemic issues, we still ask these leaders to update us on how their organization is continuing to address these issues, in particular on diversity and inclusion and climate change. 
So before we get started, I do have a few quick reminders. All participants are on mute throughout the session. Questions can be submitted through the Q&A window, and I will share the questions with the speakers at the end. Please minimize sending any messages through the chat window. Please keep your video cameras turned off to minimize potential connectivity issues. This session will be recorded and uploaded to the CA website and or ActiveView. Extracts may also be shared on social media platforms. By registering for this conference and attending this session, registrants are also given permission to the CA to use any text, photograph, or video taken during this virtual event. So keep smiling. Now we will start first with our recorded, recorded message from the president of the IAA, Mr. Jan Karst. So Kevin, you have that ready to go? Yes, I'm presenting that now. Hello, my name is Jan Kars, and for 2021, I'm the president of the IAA, the International Actuarial Association. And I'm based in the Netherlands, and I'm a pension actuary by background. And thank you for inviting me to be part of the panelists. Welcome, all participants. Unfortunately, I'm not able to attend your meeting, therefore, this recorded contribution. And one of the questions to this panel is about the top priorities of your organizations. And I can tell you a bit more about what is happening within the IAA. Last couple of years, we have been quite busy with the topic of climate risk. And as key architects of insurance, pension and social security systems, actuaries have long played important roles in managing the uncertainties of financial risk. And with the growing global recognition of the importance of climate-related risks, it is natural that actuaries are involved. So therefore, we established a task force, the so-called Climate Risk Task Force in 2020, to coordinate and facilitate the exchange of information uh, within the profession globally. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Value ...to the individual contributions of our full member associations. And also, consolidate global actuarial contributions to support the work of supranational organizations engaged in the enhancement of risk management efforts on both a macro global level and on a micro level, such as internal risk management, financial reporting, and prudential regulations in this area, as well as to provide forums for discussions and stimulate research on actuarial approaches and methodologies to implement disclosures and relevant analysis for the task force on climate related financial disclosures. Uh, fourth, uh, help optimize adaption financing strategies by quantifying and facilitating the comparison of costs and benefits over long time horizons. And at last, identify and quantify mitigation strategies that can help manage risk. So a long list of activities. And since its creation, the task force, the CRTF, has produced already three papers on this uh, subject. The importance of climate-related risks for actuaries, so more internally focused, introduction to climate-related scenarios, and climate-related scenarios apply to insurers and other financial institutions. And by the way, we've noticed that those papers were very well received by the organizations like the IAIS, International Association of Insurance Supervisors. So one of the super uh, nationals, as we call them. And so the, the link we have to those organizations. And this is just an example of topics where we really can contribute to the well-being of society, which is part of our mission. And to be able to realize this, it's quite important that we advance as a profession. And the IAA is an association of associations. 
and the CAA is one of our members. And as global organization, we are able to bundle all that actuarial knowledge, experience and skills, and also to work on the advancement of the profession. So the topic future of the actuary, which is uh, today on the agenda, is for sure one of the priorities for us. And within our strategic planning committee, we decided to form a task force focusing on questions like, yeah, what does the future actuary look like? How can we stay ahead of the curve and ensure ongoing relevance? And how do we attract the best candidates for longevity of the profession? And um, what will be the domain knowledge and the skill sets required by actuaries in the future? And how can the global profession face mega trends like artificial intelligence, machine learning and automation? We see a lot of new opportunities for the profession on climate related risks, on environmental, social and governance and sustainability issues. So our view on the question on how to secure and promote the actuarial profession is development, making a difference and stay relevant and the rest will follow. By the way, for proper collaboration within the profession, diversity and inclusion is essential. So therefore, quite interesting, both topics you are handling within your panel discussion. And I can tell you that uh, what we have done on the topic of diversity and inclusion so far. So we started to send a survey among our members in August, aiming to understand needs and gathering inputs. And most of the survey respondents have undertaken already some initiative towards the advancement of the DNI uh, activities. And some suggested that the IAA focus its efforts towards addressing topics of gender, culture, ethnicity, and generational diversity, encouraging the participation of countries less uh, represented uh, within IA structures, and assisting associations from countries where the actuarial profession is developing. So that is quite an important uh, uh, topic for us as an organization. Not only so uh, advancing the profession is for us more than only thinking of your syllabus and your education program, but also reaching out to uh, parts in the globe on the globe where the actuarial profession is not that well developed yet. And the actions uh, we intend uh, uh, to follow is uh, first of all the information sharing among our members. So where we share actions, plans and input, organizing workshops to enhance understanding of the challenges, organize events and create virtual forums where we will address topics such as the unconscious bias, but also topics of interest to actuaries earlier in their career. And uh, we need to pay attention to the internal, our internal matters as well, of course like the engagement of our members at our council meetings or the role of our nomination committee, if you talk about appointments in our leadership structure, the creation of a forum for IAA leadership, and of course, a solid communication plan. So overall, you understand why I think it is important for actuaries to really pay attention to international matters. Together, we can achieve much more than on our own. <clears throat> a little joke in between. Do you know what a garden gnome and, and electronic chips for cars have in common? No. They were both stuck on the Suez Canal, uh, canal for seven days when an evergreen cargo ship blocked it. Those seven days cost the world economy more than 10 billion euros. Some say much more as it affected worldwide supply changes, uh, chains for a month. So again, we need to keep our attention to international matters. And by the way, did you know that it was a Dutch company that was called in to free the ship up? More than ever, actuaries need to broaden their skill sets to be able to provide expertise in managing new 
and emerging risks, like the many risks associated with climate risk. And as a profession, we are not judged by what some of us learned at school 30 years ago. We are valued for our insights and our judgment. And we can get better by continually learning new things. Our career is one that involves lifelong learning and development. So please continue to participate in events such as this one. And as ask your association to participate in some of the IAA discussion forums. And now, more than ever, after uh, uh, more than 20 months into a global pandemic, it should be clear to everyone that the world is connected. And things that happen in one part of the world can have impacts on the entire globe. And I encourage you to get involved in your association. The benefits you will get are not measured in dollars or in titles, but in pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone, learning things and skills that have nothing to do with the, uh, your job, but all to do with supporting our beloved profession. Thank you and have fun the rest of the Congress. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Jan. And I would like to um, repeat that. We definitely um, would like to encourage our membership to volunteer and help us out and promote the profession and help us find ways to work with these other associations and, and leverage their, their um, resources and bench strength. I think next up, we, we, we have John, Mr. John Robinson with us now. Um, in your absence, John, we did send out our congratulations to you. Um, are you okay to go next? Um, I'm here if you can hear me. Perfect. Okay. All right. Perfect. Okay. Uh, just before, I just want to mention that the last time, Paul, we learned that this SOA was formulating a lot of initiatives to address a lot of the disruptive trends to our profession, in particular on data science and AI. We also heard a little bit about the plan for uh, funding to tackle diversity and inclusion. So we really look forward to hearing how some of these initiatives are going and any new steering or refocusing you would like to make happen. So on to you, John. Okay, good, Simone. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, all. Um, we're having a little problem with the video, but we're, we're able to get the, the um, audio to work. So I'm going to make the best of it and improvise a little bit. Um, first of all, I, I thank you for the congratulations. I heard every word that you said. And um, I, this audience may be interested in knowing that I did a little audit or I commissioned an audit. And um, you may recall that I won the election by about 211 votes. And the question was, where did those votes come from? And my audit concluded, and you'll be happy to hear this, that all of those 211 votes were the Caribbean votes. So you guys all put me over the top, and thank you very much. Um, I need to get the SOA to pay for that audit. That, that's what I need next. Uh, anyway, uh, and by the way, for those of you who are um, in the audience who are from the IABA, you may hear me say the same thing to the IABA as well. So let's have a little fun here. Uh, not working still. Okay. All right. So turning to the questions that Simone put to us, first of all, thank you for um, inviting the SOA. Um, thank you for having me on this panel. Um, it's a privilege to be a part of this group. I know most of the folks here, I think uh, there's one or two who I haven't met yet and um, look forward to doing that one-on-one -on -one, um, in, in the not too distant future. So turning to the, to the questions that um, Simone put to us, I sort of have them in four, 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 four out sets of um, notes. And so I'll start with the priorities for the organization for the SOA. Um, we actually have six. And what happened was that back in, oh, probably 2012, 2013, the SOA put together its first strategic plan. It was the first time that it really done something like that. And since that time, the president has more or less been expected to champion the strategic plan. Prior to that, presidents could, you know, perhaps to some extent do as they felt. And so we've got, we've sort of acquired that discipline in the last few years. Um, but most recently, they did something else, or we did something else. I, I wasn't there, but 
um, they looked at sort of surveyed the whole landscape of what's going on. And you've heard some of those themes with data science and so on mentioned already. And they identified six areas that we refer to as the long-term growth strategy. And really it, it's not a strategy per se, but it sort of lays down the guardrails that will guide our actions for the next several years. And I, I, I don't see any time, time limit on this particular long-term growth strategy. And so the six, the six areas are, first of all, the rise of data science as a profession and concomitant with that or coincident with that, they sort of the decline in new, new actuarial candidates. Uh, the second one is the potential for AI to change the nature of actuarial work. And in my view, this particularly affects entry level because when you come in and you're asked to get your roll up your sleeves and dig into some data or dig into a bunch of formulas, there's a lot of learning to be had from that. And if that learning goes away because that level of work is being done instead by, by a machine, that presents a challenge to the, to the, to the intellectual underpinnings of the entry-level actuary that could have implications for the actuarial judgment that needs to be uh, deployed later. So that's a serious concern. Uh, the third one is the changing nature of credentialing and skill development. And so what do we need to do to make sure that our folks have the right skills and, 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 and that our credentials are serving the right purpose? The fourth one we were concerned with um, is strengthening member and candidate engagement. The Society of Actors has now, for about 40 years, I think they started in 1981, had what we call interest sections. And, um, um, and I think we're fine. We've, we've been noticing in the last several years now, in fact, even when I left the board in 2016, prior to that, decline in participation and decline in signing up for these sections. So the question is, that, that is as much as we have to a community. So the question is whether some other approach is needed. So we'll be, as, as you'll hear later on, we'll be experimenting with some other approaches. Uh, the next one is future geographic growth. The SOA is global, as are uh, a couple other organizations on, on this panel. And, and we see potential for growth in our membership and expansion in our influence uh, outside the US and Canada. And so that's basically what that is. The sixth thing is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm, I'm very pleased to see um, where this has come. I, I was kind of a catalyst back in 2013 uh, for, for where the, the SOA has come today. And it, it's really quite, quite interesting to see how that has developed. Um, so within those six sort of guardrails, long-term growth strategy, what I'll do is share with you quickly. Um, the first strategic plan then that is based on those guardrails was just, just, just approved by the board. It's a three-year plan. It will run 2022 to 2024. And there are four strategic themes in connection with this particular time period. The first one is emphasizing education on skills. And you, you will have heard or seen announced that the, the SOA added some courses in data analytics to the pre-ASA, pre-associateship curriculum. Uh, we felt that was necessary for, for our young folks to have the skills uh, that are expected of us. And we also, in, we also introduced um, some, some study, try to strengthen the soft skills. Every, everybody says we don't do a good job of it. And so we've integrated uh, some, e, we call it EQ and AQ, emotional quotient and adaptability quotient, uh, some of that into our, into our program. So that's the first one. The second one is accelerating international growth. And I think you can tell where that ties back to the guardrails pretty easily. The third one is perhaps a little unique to, to the generational change that we're seeing. Um, when I became an actor, it was pretty much if you could do math and, and if somebody was willing to employ you, uh, you could become an actuary. But young folks these days are trying to, they, they want more of a societal purpose. 
And so we want to address that uh, in our next strategic, strategic plan. So putting a spotlight on the societal purpose for being an actuary. Um, and the fourth one is cultivating community experience. And that goes back to the candidate member and candidate engagement that I mentioned. Now, within these, <laughs> within these, I could drill down all day on all of them. So I'll have to stop here at this point. So there's these four, six um, sort of major overarching challenges, and then four of them make up our, our strategic plan for the next three years. Uh, in terms of reaching out to other organizations, I think in our case, um, it's not so much as reaching out for others for support, uh, it's more in the, in, this, in the idea of supporting others. And, um, and that pertains to the accelerating international growth, where we will, you know, we'll be looking for, for opportunities to be of service to other, other actual org organizations throughout the world. Now, this is something that is personally very near and dear to my heart. And, um, and I'm looking forward to participating in, you know, weighing in and influencing the direction of that to the, to the extent that I can. Um, the next part was the future of the actuary. What do you think your organization can do to secure and promote? Um, we heard it in the debate, and I think we are generally quite secure in our traditional roles. But oftentimes there's talk about we should do more, we should go beyond those boundaries. Um, um, at the ICA 2018, we celebrated, I think many of you will remember, I am 100,000. And what that was, was 100,000 credential actors in the whole world. That's not a big number. And it, it's not going to become a million anytime soon. So we're in a small profession and, and even on the global scale, look, global stage, that may limit our capacity to influence, influence certain things. Um, so, but turning more to the question, um, yeah, I think we're pretty secure. We're always looking for other ways to leverage that. On the traditional, this is probably a traditional role, but the IFRS 17 is one of those things that I think is gonna push demand for actuaries um, where, it, it particularly in act, less actually developed countries, uh, it might push some demand there because um, it, it's, it's, just this, it's just this very actuarial animal that, that cannot be done by just accountants alone. Um, my, my, my perspective is that no one really does what we do in terms of the combination. I, I think during the debate, you heard a list of skills that other folks have, but no one else really brings them together. Mortality, investment, morbidity, long non-life contingencies, finance, nobody really brings those together and to make sense of them. So where I think we will always be unique is in that combination and maintaining or even increasing the value of the actuarial judgment uh, to our principles is what is going to make continue to make us relevant. In terms of working together with other organizations, um, you know, each organization has its own mission and has its own perspective. Uh, and, and I'll use the IAA just as an example because that was part of the question when I first saw it. Um, our mission is, is quite different. The SOA is a credentialing organization. We issue credentials, uh, fellowship, associateship, and so on and so forth, and, and now a growing number of certificates. The IAA is not. They have a different, different, pers uh, different engagement. So they engage with supranational organizations, such as the IAIS and the IASB. The SOA does not. And so you find that both organizations will be promoting the value of the actuary, but in very different ways. Um, and if you look at the CAA, it's the same thing. You're not credentialing, you have your own perspectives, you provide certain services to your regulators and so on and so forth. And so your mission fits in with your context. The IAA is currently developing what I believe is its first strategic plan. I mentioned we've only had strategic plans since, since um, the 2010s, if you will. 
And they're developing their first one, certainly under a new organizational structure. And, you know, the SOA as being the largest um, organization in the world um, does have some influence over the direction along with, of course, I, I think just about everybody else on this panel, the organizations that you represent. I'll turn to diversity and, um, and I mentioned earlier that, that, that I have been a catalyst myself for what the SOA has accomplished in diversity. Uh, this year, the, the DE, we have a diversity, equity and inclusion committee and they've developed a, a framework with three strategic goals. The first is to cultivate equitable and inclus inclusive member and candidate experiences. So it's making sure that everybody feels at home and welcome. The second one is glowing the actuarial pipeline with an emphasis on underrepresented groups, which is also a very big passion of mine. And the third one is described as the championing DEI to serve the public interest. Um, so far, a lot of this, a lot of what we've talked about is based on the US. And as you move from country to country, you're going to find different issues, different ways of going about them, uh, and, and certainly ways of not going about them. Uh, we also have a diversity, equity, and inclusion research advisory committee, which oversees a number of research projects related to diversity. Um, you know, one of the things about um, data science is that we all think that data is having huge volumes of data is a good idea. But if there's bias inherent in the data, and if you use those, if you use the data uh, in an automated decision making process, that is, you don't interfere with anything, uh, you might get results that you that you don't like from a diversity perspective. Um, so DEI is, I guess my point is DEI is related. All of these things are tied together. They're not really, they're not, they're, they are areas of significant overlap that we need to address. Um, the most recently, there has been a, 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 several affinity groups have formed quite spontaneously uh, without really any, any, any major pushing from the actual organizations here in the United States. Abacus Actuaries is a group of, of Chinese, and I think they include China, Taiwan, Hong Kong. The South, e the South Asian network of actuaries includes uh, people with the ethnicity of India, Pakistan, if I got that right. There's a network of actuarial women and allies, and I think one of their big concerns is women in high places having leadership roles. There's the Sexuality and Gender Alliance of act Actuaries. Um, it, it really thrills me that, first of all, these organizations are very spontaneous. They're coming up from the grassroots and they are, um, they, they are agnostic as to which organization folks belong to. This is not, this is not SOAs, not CAS. People just come together around those common interests. And, and, and I, I, for one, I'm, I'm quite pleased to see that. Uh, the last question is on climate change, and I'll just mention that the SA, SOA has always been about education and research, that's our main thing. Um, but we recently strengthened our research arm, um, actually created a 501c3 entity uh, with its own board and everything. Um, within that, there is a catastrophe and climate, cl catastrophe and climate strategic research program that studies the impact of catastrophic events, changing climate patterns and frequency slash severity of events in, on the public and on the insurance industry. So we're doing what we can. Uh, we're doing some serious work there. I know there are some very forward thinking folks um, uh, uh, looking into these issues uh, uh, much more than I ever could, that's for sure. Um, in terms of whether there, one of the things that this new research institute does that's different is that we're trying to do projects that have societal impact. And, and I would say here that um, the other thing is that we're getting, we're using sponsors, we can use sponsors for our projects. So all of these projects are not just funded by the SOA. And, and that allows us to take in a wider range of projects and it's not inconceivable 
that there could be a project that would have something to do with the Caribbean conducted or, or worked on um, in conjunction with the Society of Actuaries. So if anyone has any ideas of that sort, um, I think Dale Hall, who I believe will be on at least one other panel um, for, this, for this particular event, uh, you certainly could, could uh, bring that to his attention. So that's gonna conclude my, my remarks. I thank you again. I'm sorry you can't see me, but I can see you. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. Um, that societal purpose for being an actuary resonates not only with the young ones, I'm sure, um, but we're happy to hear there are so many initiatives going on, the themes that we wanted you to discuss. Um, we're running behind time already. So what we're gonna go, we're gonna go straight on to Matt next to talk about what the Institute of the Faculty of Actuaries has been doing on some of these things. On to you, Matt. Thanks, Simone, and thanks for inviting me here today. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, um, I, I'll cover the same questions as uh, John and Jan before. So first is, you know, what are the top two priorities for the IFO at the moment? <clears throat> I'm actually not sure what was said last year, but um, the, the IFO did publish its strategy um, in early 2020. So it's hard for me to, uh, to move away from that. That strategy is sort of halfway to being implemented. So the, the two things I'd, I'd, I'd point to are, are two key pillars. Uh, the first, which is repositioning the profession. And the second is transforming the membership experience. So I'll, I'll just spend a few minutes talking about each of those. First of all, repositioning the, the, the profession. Um, well, you know, my view, uh, well, it's factual, really. Uh, you know, the profession has traditionally been very strong in financial services sector. Um, and I agree with, with pretty much everything John said just now. Um, there's probably going to be growth in that area because of things like IFRS 17 over the next few years. But I suppose our view is that longer term, and by longer term, I mean sort of 10, 20 years, um, I do think we're going to see a change. Uh, you know, we're already seeing a decline in, in, in uh, defined benefit pension schemes in the UK, which are big empl um, employer of actuaries. And I think as AI and other technologies come in, you know, um, I think they will replace the need for actuaries to a degree. Um, I don't think we're going to fall off a cliff, so it's not going to change um, quickly, but I think we will see a slow tapering off of those traditional areas. Um, so, you know, if we want to continue to grow the profession, um, we need to address that. Uh, and, and the only way that we can really uh, address it is to, is to broaden out, broaden out the profession into wider fields. Um, you know, so I have a vision, you know, in 20 years time, you know, why shouldn't actuaries be working in industry more broadly than financial services? So I'm convinced that our skills could be used in industries like pharmaceutical energy sectors. You know, the, the skills we have in assessing risk and bringing financial risk together um, is, 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 are really useful. Um, the, the reason that hasn't happened is that it's never ha had to happen in the past. You know, we've been comfortable in those traditional domains. Um, but I do think that over time, uh, that will change and we need to think about that. Okay, so the second point was transforming the membership experience. Um, look, um, membership of the, of the IFOA, same as other profession, uh, other, other membership bodies is not cheap, um, you know, and we can't take um, renewal of, of, of that mem membership granted. We need to demonstrate continued value to our members. Um, and my observation there, I suppose, is, is certainly within the IFA, but I think it's true more broadly, is that we are very engaged um, it, with, uh, with, with members when they're going through the qualification process. Um, but, you know, as soon as they qualify, people tend to drift away and they focus on their careers. And then you can tend to get people like me very relatively late in their careers coming back and trying to give something back to the profession. But there's a, a big void in the middle where we, we really, you know, we lose contact with a lot of our members. I think that needs to change. We need to constantly be seen to be adding value to our membership. Um, and in particular in that, that, that sort of middle part of people's career, uh, we need to be offering them stuff to, to show that they can develop and not lose touch with them. In doing that, we need to recognize that, that all our members are unique and there's not one size fits all. Um, the IFA is trying to do a lot in that space. We, we recently um, made all of our online events free, which I think is a great thing for us to be able to do. Um, I've already observed that that's you know, really opened up 
um, a lot of the IFRA is offering to a much broader range of people rather than it being sort of limited to a relatively small number. And I, and I do think we should be working more collaboratively with, uh, with other organisations. You know, the IFRA um, you know, is one of the, the biggest supporters of the IA already. Uh, you, we often see senior volunteers from the IFRA leading certain initiatives within the IA. We need to do that more. And you know, there are certain areas where I think we can work collaboratively with other other um, national um, uh, membership bodies as well. There's always the sort of competitive edge a bit, but the, the, you know, there has to be a greater good somewhere where we can all come together uh, to, grow, to grow the profession. Okay, so the, the next question I think was um, about the future of, of the actuary and what our organizations can do to secure uh, that future. Again, I'd sort of point to three areas here. The, the first would be, would be simply promoting the profession. I think I think the membership bodies have a, a role to play there. The, the reality, John said, the reality is there's you know hundred odd thousand qualified actuaries um, in the world. That's that's small compared to accountants and lawyers. They're, they're an order of magnitude bigger than us. Um, and you know the, the, the reality is that, that we are relatively niche and obscure. If you ask most members of the public, um, they don't know what an actuary is still. Uh, and I think that's true for most employers. Um, and our goal surely has to be to change both of those aspects. Um, you know, we did some research in the IFRA years a few years ago. You know, if you ask um, the average HR director outside of traditional financial services, you know, do you, would you do you need to employ an actuary? And their answer would be no. But if you then ask them, do you need to employ someone with these skills and explain the skills an actuary had, they go. Yeah, absolutely. That would be great. We, we could really use some, someone like that. So that's the bridge we need to make. Um, and we need to be bolder as a profession. Um, we need to uh, be more extrovert. I often talk about this, you know, we're too introvert as a, as a, as a profession at the moment. And, we, and that does need to change. Can you hold on one second? I'm just uh, need to pause for one second. And there we have the reality of life in a COVID world. <laughs> sorry, I'm really sorry about that. Because we're running late, I was getting kicked out of the room. I've told them to wait a few, few minutes. So um, apologies for that. There we have that. the reality of life in a COVID world. <laughs> sorry, I'm really sorry about that. Because we're running late, I was getting kicked out of the room. I've told them to wait a few, few minutes. So um, apologies for that. There we have that. the reality of life in a COVID world. <laughs> Sorry, I'm really sorry about Can that. You? Because we're running late, I was getting kicked out of the room. I've told him. There's to a wait. loop. There's a loop can, going on. Can someone, can you hear me, Simone? Shall I carry on? Yeah, I can, yeah please. Now it's dark. Go ahead. Right, so we're I'm really sorry about that. Um, uh, yeah, the, the second thing we need to do, we, we need to promote the refresh, and I've said that. We need to equip our actors to, uh, to do new roles. And there's no point in me um, talking about what, what actuaries can do in a broader world if, if we're not equipping actuaries to have those skills so that they, they can broaden out. You know, I feel quite strongly that our, I mentioned our stronghold of traditional financial services. Our education at the moment perpetuates us moving into those areas. The, the, the routes to fellowship are very much linked around those traditional areas. If we want to broaden out, we need to change the core syllabus so that uh, there are multiple routes to, um, to, to qualification. Um, I'll talk about climate later, but that's an obvious route. Data science is another one. Um, so so, so that, that, that's the second thing I think we need, we need to do. We need, we need to equip our actors so they have those skills. As the world changes, we continually educate them uh, post-qualification. And I think we also need to make sure we have a voice in society. So I think, you know, when I entered the profession 30 years ago, uh, the profession, I think, was more influential um, in, in sort of the wider field of society. Uh, I think we've lost our way a little bit as a profession over the last 30 years, and we need to reclaim that ground. And an obvious way to do that is through thought leadership initiatives. So making sure that we have a voice in some of the key societal issues of the day, whether it's you know, funding for pension schemes or intergenerational fairness, it's that type of thing. We need to step up and we need to regain that, regain that ground. Um, absolutely. Okay, um, diversity and inclusion was the next thing. Um, look, the IFRA is absolutely passionate about this. It's absolutely fundamental to, to what we believe in and our values. Um, and the, this is the, the, the IFRA is doing a huge amount. We're about to, um, to launch a new strategy on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, which you'll see come out uh, in the next month or two. It's been approved by our council. It has three pillars. 
uh, you know, the stuff we can absolutely control. So our organization ourselves and our members, we need to set the right standards uh, to make sure that everyone's behaving um, in the way that we expect them to. We need to make sure our exams are, um, are, are fair and uh, equitable so that everyone can access them. Um, we also then need to have the ability to influence others uh, uh, who, who we don't directly control, but have a, an indirect uh, influence on. So that would be you know, choosing the organizations which we engage with, whether it's universities or, or employers and, and have the zero tolerance for anyone who's not um, behaving the, the way they should to the standards that we expect. And the third pillar is to make sure we have a voice where we don't have really direct influence, um, but we need to still have a voice and speak up and make, make, the, right, uh, make the right decisions there. You know, I, I work for, my day job is working for Aviva and, and a really good analogy I heard recently on, on this was the, the hosepipe analogy, which, uh, which just, just be with me a second. If you're washing your car, you turn the tap on, you rub the hose out and you press go and, and no water comes out. Uh, so you go back and you find a kink in the hosepipe, you unkink it, you go try again, still no water comes out. So you go back and you find a kink further back down the line. And, 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 and I think that's a really good analogy for DEI because as an employer of, of Aviva, you know, we're trying to change, um, our, our, we're trying to make a change in this space, but to a degree, we can only work with the materials that we're um, given. And, and the IFOA and other member societies are responsible for, if you like, um, uh, providing uh, individuals, people to the employment market. And if there's a kink in that part of the process, there's only so much that employers like Aviva and others can actually do to, to fix it. And I think the membership bodies, including the IFO, have a, have a key part of that hose pipe, if you like. They're not at the start of it, uh, but, but if, 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 the, if the membership bodies don't unkink their, their part, then the employers can't thrive. And similarly, they have, a, they have a role in going back further down the pipeline to influence educators, schools, universities, et cetera, to make sure that all the kinks are undone there. So I like that analogy, so, uh, so hopefully you do too. Um, the, the final thing, um, conscious of time, it, it was climate. Look, I just feel really passionately about climate. I, I talked about moving into wider fields. I really think that we have the core skills to, to just do so much in this space. Um, you know, we have the risk analysis, we have the skills, you know, in terms of analyzing stress scenarios over a long period. Uh, what we don't really have just yet is, is the domain skill around climate, climate science, but actually that's relatively easy to obtain. And it goes back to what I said earlier. We, we need to make sure we have the materials available to educate our members so that they can get up that relatively short curve very quickly and, and use their broader, you know, actual core skills to get involved and add value. And climate affects everyone. It affects all of society, it affects all of industry. So that would be a great opportunity, I think, for us to, to, to broaden out. Um, but we need, we, need to, we need to get on and do it. And again, as I said earlier, we need to be brave and we need to be bold. Um, and, 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 and if we're not, if we're not, someone else will come in to fill that void. And we've seen that with data science. Um, so, you know, we need, we need to, we need to um, as I say, we need to be extrovert, we need to be bold. Right, that, that was it, Simone, I'll, I'll hand back to you. Okay, thanks so much, Matt. Um, so interesting concepts and ideas that we're aware of. And I just wanted to mention that some employers are actually now going outside of the actual associations for their entry level positions for that DEI objective and hoping to try to convince them to, to see the value of um, taking the actual exams after. So to the extent we can work together to increase that pool, that, that would be great. Okay. Next up, um, we're going on to Kyle. Kyle, I know you're here with a lot of um, the other associations with, are well resourced and our challenges might be a little bit different and our approaches, um, but I'll um, hand it over to you to, to um, share or, um, or um, progress on those. Thank you very much, Simone, and uh, welcome to uh, my colleagues from our partner associations. The and I do know we're under time constraints, so I'll try. I'm going to I'm going to run with highlights. Um, the associations you see on the screen here are ones that the CAA 
partners with and will continue to partner with. The CAA, as John mentioned, is not a credentialing organization. Our members are members of other um, actuarial associations, whether it's the SOA, the CAS, the CIA, the IFOA. I think we may even have a few members from ASA. But, um, and, and we have different levels of relationships. Uh, we participate uh, very actively in the IAA, the International Actuarial Association. And as I mentioned, we have long-standing existential relationships with the examining bodies that our members have qualified under. We also deliberately develop relationships with other um, associations like the South African Association and the Kenyan Association and the Indian Association, because it's as we build relationships, we grow. Um, um, the Caribbean. Caribbean. <laughs> Okay. Um, in answer, and one of the things we realize is around the world, the uh, the larger developed associations are grappling with the same issues, uh, whether it's diversity or climate change or data science or all of these things. The developing uh, country associations, we have slightly different issues, but they are similar, or you certainly have analogs in the the different places around the world. And as everybody has been saying, the, many of these issues, whether it's grappling with societal purpose, and I really like that one, are things you can't do by yourself. In answer to the specific questions, um, what are the top two priorities that we've been dealing with in the Caribbean for the past two years? Unfortunately, I'd have to say we've been reactive to, we've been fighting fires. There's this really big fire called COVID, which hasn't gone out yet. Um, if I had to choose another one, I'd probably say IFRS 17 because that's been using a lot of resources. And I'll give you the context of that. The Caribbean is made up of disparate, small, um, I, I can't even say island economies because Guyana and the Suriname aren't really islands, but we're all small economies. We're all subject to external shocks, whether it's in commodity prices, tourism patterns, changing rules in global financial services. Um, and if you want to operate in the Caribbean, you have to, uh, you have different regulatory regimes in each territory. The point that I'm making is that we often don't have economies of scale. And so uh, even something like IFRS 17 requires regulatory change, which requires dealing with regulators in multiple jurisdictions. Um, and that's occupying a lot of space, a lot of resources. And we have the normal list of things uh, to deal with. And when you drop COVID on top of that, and I'm not just talking about our members helping governments model COVID, though we've done that too, but just dealing with the economic and societal disruption across our territories has been um, uh, unbelievable. I don't think if anybody had been writing books or TV shows about the events of the past few years, we would have taken it as a credible show. We would have switched it off. We said, no, not real, not going to happen. But yet we're, leaving, we're living in the midst of it. So absent fighting huge fires like that, what are the two biggest things that we need to be dealing or likely to be dealing with over the next two years? Unfortunately, it looks like we're going to be dealing with COVID again for at least the next year. Um, and we're going to be dealing with IFRS 17 as well. In the midst of that, we are dealing with, well, one of the challenges you have when you have limited resources is how do you deal with the longer term existential realities um, like climate change, like integrating data science into your university educational programs to make sure that the recent graduates or the future graduates are not irrelevant. Um, I'll just uh, pause there. We'll be discussing that more. We have lots of space in the questions. Um, let's talk a brief, briefly about diversity and inclusion. In terms of diversity and inclusion in the actuarial profession, this is something that the Caribbean Actuarial Association has been involved in from day one, being involved with people like John Robinson, who set up the CAA, who also happened to set up IABA and other um, uh, diversity-oriented groups. Um, so, for example, one of the founders of the CAA was 
Dame Daisy Koch, the first black female fellow of the Institute of Faculty of Actuaries. CEA members have been leading diversity challenges for years. Our own um, Kathy Lynn has been running a diversity um, program uh, under the auspices of the IAA now for several years. Actually, a little bit before it became fashionable in the actuarial profession. And we continue to support her initiatives and diversity initiatives generally from many different perspectives. But it's always good to um, do some self-reflection. So for example, Kathy Lynn is not on this presentation, otherwise she would be um, bombarding the chat links with questions like, what are we doing for the bigger societal questions, microinsurance, gig economy, reaching out beyond um, the, how could I put it, the middle class and upper class product development that tends to go on because the lower socioeconomic groups tend to be not automatically included when we are thinking about what we're doing. And so, for example, in the Caribbean, when you talk about inclusion, we are good at gender, we're good at race, we're good at religion. Are we terribly great at socioeconomic groups? And I'll mean that, and I, what I mean by that is in terms of in post-colonial hierarchical societies, um, the good schools tend to pull from the middle and the upper classes. So um, are we doing enough to serve those at the bottom of society? And I'll just leave that there because those are the kind of questions that are not easy to deal with. On climate change, one of the things we've been organizing for the past few years is developing a Caribbean climate index which is modeled off of the North American Climate Index. And as with many other of our initiatives, we've been working with the SOA. Um, we've been looking at what the Australians have been doing. In general, uh, we, we develop by association, by relationship, by partnership. Um, and I'd just, actually just like to pause here and, both, and commend everybody on this call, the SOA, the IFOA, and the CAS, because I've been noticing an increasing trend in reduced fees for people from developing countries. Um, and that's actually very, very important in improving the profession and access to the profession in countries and for people that otherwise couldn't afford it. So keep up that good work. Uh, we are commending your initiatives and we will continue to work with you all. And I'm gonna pause there because I know we're short on time. Okay, thanks, Kyle. I appreciate that. And hitting on the, the points, the important points quickly. Um, next in line, we have Helen Pulio, the president elect of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries. Similar to the SOA, there are many CIA actuaries working in the Carib Caribbean region. And in the past, the CIA has been very collaborative um, with the CIA in sharing of their ideas and guidance. Even earlier this um, year, they reached out to us for a bilateral call to talk about their plans. And we really appreciate that. So I'm going to uh, hand it over to Helen to, to let us know um, what new is going on and what she hopes to continue on. Helen? Thank you, Simone. You can hear me? So good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here as president-elect of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries. I am a life actuary by background, just for your information. And thank you again for inviting the CIA to this panel. So I'll jump right into it, given we're short on time. So in terms of our priorities, we're currently working on the following three. Education is first, the future of actuaries second, and membership engagement, which obviously includes uh, DNI. So let's talk about education. So we've recently taken a monumental decision to create our own Canadian education pathways to be effective in 2023. With all due respect, although the SOA and the CAS programs were really good, we felt that we should take ownership of the education of our future actuaries. A key element in designing the new program is that the title FCIA be transferable to other international actuarial associations. It therefore has to meet the highest quality standards. The new program includes three pathways. One, which is 100% Canadian, 
A second one for associates uh, from programs offered by other countries. And a third pathway for experienced actuaries with full qualification with other recognized programs. For the latter pathway, the CI will require minimum Canadian experience and a pointed evaluation in order for the candidates to become FCIAs. The new education program includes a combination of training by our accredited universities and a series of professionalism courses, modules and exams, in addition to minimum Canadian experience requirement in order to become an FCIA. We still have a lot of work to do to execute on this priority, but it's well underway. Our second priority is to provide our members with better practice area content and build public awareness of our profession. This includes advancing the profession on climate change risk while continuing to offer guidance on IFR 17 and predictive analytics. We have a practice development council reporting directly to the board uh, to proactively encourage and develop actuarial practice, to make recommendation with respect to marketing of the profession, to lead the development of emerging areas and promote and enhance the hiring of actuaries in non-traditional roles. We have also started a round of discussions with employers of actuaries to better understand what our perceived strengths and weaknesses are. On the subject of predictive analytics, we observe that data scientists are becoming more and more prevalent in the insurance industry. While they have deeper statistical knowledge than the average actuary, they do not typically understand the intricacies of insurance products. We believe that actuaries have a significant role to play in this area. We need our actuaries to ramp up their knowledge of predictive analytics and its applications to optimize business output and improve performance. We have been running specialized seminars and sessions on the subject, and it is part of our current practice education course, which students must take to obtain their FCIAs. Moving to IFI 17, we have a steering committee who's committed to informing members of change and developments as they occur. Our Actuarial Guidance Council has adopted the final version of the IAA Note 100. We have offered a supplemental note to provide Canadian specific guidance and clarification on several topics discussed in the IAN 100. We've also issued over 20 educational notes related to the implementation of IFR 17 to guide our actuaries with this very technical task. Moving to climate change, we have a committee on climate change and sustainability reporting to our practice development council. Its role is to educate actuaries on the relevance of climate change risks to all our practice areas participate in research and collaborate in the development of climate change research in Canada and internationally, play a constructive role in addressing climate change, in providing advice to our clients and input to public policy. Finally, it does promote the expertise of actuaries in this area. We are collaborating with other actuarial associations, including the SOA and the IFOA, and we believe that this will be key in getting traction in this rapidly evolving topic. We don't have time to build everything from scratch and to duplicate effort. We believe that actuaries have an important role to play in the identification of climate change risk, quantification of those risks, 
and risk management. Let me move to our third priority, which is about improving membership engagement. We want to integrate and promote the use of the latest technical tools like predictive analytics and implement DNI principles and strategies. Earlier this year, we compared our CIA membership with Statistics Canada, and we discovered that some nationalities were underrepresented in our organization. We're planning to address this through high school presentation, partnering with the Actuarial Foundation of Canada, and meeting with various ethnic associations. We're also adding sessions at our general meetings and professional education course to raise the awareness of this issue. If the above was not enough, we are also revisiting our bylaws to modernize them and reviewing our rules of professional conduct. We believe that this is very important to develop new skills and implement our new education system. We hope that this will increase membership engagement and public awareness of the actuarial professions. Thank you. Thanks very much. That's a very um, technical, te te tactical explanation of what's going on, and we appreciate that. Um, I think we are going to be moving on next to Lusani Mulazi, the president of ASA. Thank you very much, Simone. And uh, I'm returning here. I was here last year, and I remember that in 2017 I was in the Bahamas. Uh, I really do hope that we can get back to the normal ways because I haven't seen any of your other islands there and I definitely still want to see them. And uh, so let's hope that uh, uh, we know the situation changes. Um, I'm here at the southern tip of, of, of Africa. The Chorus Society of South Africa um, is quite a, an old organization. Um, it used to, uh, we used to use the IFOA education system for a very long time. Um, we established our own in 2010. 2010. Uh, so the Canadians, um, if they, if Helen, if you want to learn anything or two about that path that you've uh, embarked on, uh, you are welcome to, to speak to us. Um, we have that experience. And we still do have some subjects that we, uh, uh, some of the IFOA subjects that we write, some of the earlier technical uh, subjects. Um, and in terms of, uh, of our focus, and then I just looked through the presentation that I uh, delivered last year, and, and a very, very important for us to, to, to think about where we are on the continent of Africa and the kind of things that we are struggling with. Um, and, and then I'll touch on the issue of climate change, but I think one has to recognize that there are issues that are very big for us. Um, inequality continues to be a very big uh, problem, uh, not only within Africa, but when you compare Africa to the rest of the world. Um, and that gap is widening and COVID did not help with that. Um, and, and as far as uh, COVID is, is concerned, that has generated the bulk of discussions within our profession over the last two years. Um, uh, comments on the management of the crisis and the understanding of the science behind it, et cetera. Um, so actuaries have been very engaged. South African actuaries are not very shy. Um, they, they tend to get stuck in. And, um, and some, of, some, some, some of us are perhaps stubborn. Um, so we do end up having very vigorous um, debates and discussions about all sorts of things. So, so COVID-19 has introduced that kind of challenge um, for us. And it came on the back of uh, when I was inaugurated as the president back in 2019, uh, that I said, look, we need to look to the future. We have to talk about how we're going to be relevant, to continue to be relevant, given the major, uh, the, the mega trends that we see, um, the, 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 you know, the auto, uh, optimization that is happening, AI, all of that where we, we, we seriously will not be needed to perform certain tasks. But how, how do we make sure that we remain um, relevant? So we identified that as a focus area. 
uh, we say to ourselves that we, we still we want to see ourselves being a global leader in context-based solutions. And that doesn't mean that uh, every mem every every HRA has to be a member of the HR society. That just means that every other organization uh, will see value in collaborating with the HR Society of South Africa or engaging actuaries who um, are members of the HR Society of South Africa. And that has been our attitude for many years. So that objective recognizes what we have always been doing, but also setting for us a challenge to say we need to do even more than that. So if you consider the International Electoral Association, um, we're very involved there. Um, and we do encourage our members to be active in the, uh, in the committees that are set up there, in the sections as well, and, 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 and to even avail themselves for leadership positions there. And, and, and they tend to do that. So if you look at the newer areas, like your banking, your data science, your micro insurance, or we've had members of our profession that have been leaders in those positions. We do want to see even more of that happening uh, going forward. And so we feel quite strongly about the issue of, uh, of being uh, you know, uh, global leaders in context-based solutions. To support that uh, uh, strategy um, or, or that objective, um, there's a, a focus on, on, on research. Um, there's a focus on, on public interest. And, and as you consider the COVID-19, it, it, it was touching on both those areas, the area of public policy, uh, as well as um, the need to do research. And we have certainly learned a lot about uh, doing research on the go, uh, not just the kind of research that takes forever to do, but you know, one that you need to produce something in two, three weeks. Uh, what a challenge uh, it has been, but I think it has uh, alerted us to the potential that we have um, as, as, as actuaries um, uh, to, 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 to influence policy. But I think we have a long way to go in terms of how, you know, the, the understanding within the profession and how best to do that. But I think we accept that, uh, uh, you know, the challenges that we've experienced uh, are part of growth um, uh, when, we, when you want to stretch out. So we very much with uh, what Max said about uh, you know, wider fields, and we've been on that path for, for many years. Um, as I've mentioned now, the, the banking, uh, which um, we've opened it up the rest of the world to, 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 you know, to take part in that, for us to collaborate uh, with the rest of the world in that. Um, so wider fields, uh, we, we, we're pressing, we're pushing. Um, we want to see actuaries being active in many um, areas. Um, I happen to also be uh, a, a faculty member at the university um, and I supervise uh, some students and it's very, it's a good opportunity to, to give them a topic that they've never looked at before and for them to use extra skills. Recently, um, I've just uh, uh, passed a student who, who did um, uh, his research on food supply in 2050, supply and demand food in 2050. Just looking at the projections of how food is going to be produced going forward, and then also how the population is going to grow, uh, do a, uh, some a modeling exercise there uh, to say, you know, are we actually going to have enough food, and what are the factors that are in, important in that exercise? Um, and that was certainly very, very um, something very interesting that the student did. And, and as as for as you know, South Africa is um, you know majority black um, and, 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 and minority white, although if you look at the trust society, it's, it's, it's the reverse. So the diversity and inclusion has always been an issue that uh, this profession needs to diversify. And we've had uh, you know, activities running for, for many years to do that. It's improving a, a lot, but there's still a long way to go. Um, and then even in terms of more qualitative aspects, still have a, a long way to go. Um, and, and yes, the Actual Society of South Africa cannot exist uh, on its own. We're very active in, on the rest of the continent to develop the, the, the professions there uh, and, and to collaborate, doing it in a collaborative uh, fashion. Um, and we value our partnerships with uh, the CAA, uh, the CIA, um, uh, the SOA. We, we want a closer relationship with the SOA. They don't always want that, but you know, John, John is a nice guy, so he wants that. So we're pursuing that. Um, and, and the rest of the other uh, you know, organizations, um, we're always open to. We, 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 we acknowledge that we cannot exist on our own. And, and I4A has been a, a very great partner over the years. So that we're very thankful for. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lusani. Um, um, Jessica, sorry about that, but we've got, we're tight on time. And um, 
Jessica Leong is the president of the CAS Association. Um, the presentation last year from Steve was short but supercharged, so we definitely look forward to hear about the wide follow up on the wide range of initiatives that he had made us aware of that were in play. And so over to you, Jessica. Thanks, Simone, and I'll be really brief so we have time for some questions. Okay, so look, the CAS and the way we've been thinking about the future actuary, it's very much focused on being able to solve the important business problems that we face for us in the property and casualty insurance industry using data and analytics. Um, and I'll contrast that with the way we used to see ourselves, right? We used to see ourselves as a society that furthered the advancement of actuarial practice. Um, and I, I would say it's a very welcome shift from focusing on the process, because frankly, like think about it, you go to a, let's say you go to another profession, you're a doctor, you don't care what techniques they're using. You just want them to solve your medical problem, right? I would say the same thing goes for us. No one cares about the techniques we're using. They just want us to be able to solve the important problems facing our particular field for us, PNC insurance today. So that's our envisioned future. And we believe that our members need three core skill sets to actually get us there. Number one, advanced analytics. And that does mean data science, right? Big data is just going to get bigger. It's not going to get any smaller. Um, there is only one way this is heading. So we just cannot ignore that. And we do need to sharpen our skills in terms of advanced analytics. Number two is business problem solving. And going the extra mile beyond you know, actuaries have always been encouraged to have good communication skills, right? You need to do your analysis. You need to tell your stakeholders about your analysis in a way they can understand. We want to push that one step further. Not only do your stakeholders have to understand your results, you need to work with them to do something with that and actually solve the business problem. And then lastly, number three is being able to really understand the domain in which you work for, which is for us again, property and casualty insurance. And that third one is a real um, enabler of frankly, being able to solve business problems competently. So we're feeling that someone with all three skill sets, if you can imagine a Venn diagram, that is, that is the actuary of the future. Okay. And then back to you, Simone. Oh, wow, I appreciate that. Um... <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. Um, we can go on to some questions in the q and I'm gonna to try to combine some. Um, we talked about, we heard from you on examinations and trying to uh, launch certificates, which would um, protect this, the future of the actuary. Climate, I think climate change certificate was talked about um, by the Institute and you, there's a predictive analytics certificate. Um, is there any thought about making these um, specializations uh, more affordable? Because in some cases, members do want to take them um, and their employers may not be convinced of the value as yet. Is there any, any thought, this is for anybody, of, as to how we can make these uh, specializations uh, more affordable and um, to the broader, the broader student membership globally? I'm not going to really pick on anybody, but if uh... this is John, I'll, I'll, I'll start. And I, I, I guess I, I have heard this a lot in general about affordability of, of SOA um, exams, credentials and all of that. And I, I think it's something we do take seriously. Uh, Kyle mentioned that perhaps something is being done about it. Uh, there's nothing that I can, you know, I, I can announce as such today. But we are aware of it. And so all I can say at this point is continue to make us aware of the issue. Um, it, it is useful to know that, you know, we, we did the IFRI certificate. I, I actually personally uh, sat it myself. And I heard um, from, I had a chat with someone from Pakistan, um, uh, just just wanted to meet the, <clears throat> the leader in the Pakistan actual organization and he mentioned that there were 20 Pakistanis in the course. Well, I, you know, if, if you don't tell me that, I can't know. You see what I'm saying? So continue to make noise, let, make us aware of where, where the demand actually is. Uh, and, and that gives us a better chance to respond to it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yes, Simone, just... I would echo what John said. Um, 
it is good to hear that feedback. Uh, there are opportunities for continuing education, obviously, for all of these societies. Um, I'll just name a couple notably. I know a lot of us have talked about data science. I'm sure a lot, a lot of these societies have something to offer, including us, with our certified specialist in predictive analytics. Um, there are a lot of options out there. And look, in terms of more affordable options, um, dare I say it, you could turn away from <laughs> what, what we're all offering. And there are a lot of free online offerings, right, <laughs> through Coursera and EDX that I've, I've done myself. Um, and it is entirely free. Uh, so the, there are also opportunities there. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, we have a question on IFR 17. As a profession, I know we've been swamped with polishing off, polishing IFR 17, making sure it's per perfect with all the reconciliations. And it's taken away a lot of brilliant minds, you know, on other critical issues that are just creeping up, like climate change, providing healthcare at uh, reasonable cost, and other important issues um, that we think are also critical to protecting the future of the actuary. How how do we how do you try to balance um, balance this as leaders? How do the associations try to balance this? I can start maybe it's a land for the CIA. So I mean, I mean, obviously, IFRS 17, as as you said, required a lot of time and effort. Uh, but it was expected that our industry was going to be ready, and we couldn't be ready without the immense support of the actuarial profession in combination with the accounting profession. So we spend a lot of time. I think most of it is behind us in terms of development and support to our actuary. So as an association, we feel that a lot of the work has been accomplished. We're now turning to other issues like I discussed earlier. So more to come in other areas, but we couldn't avoid it, unfortunately. Yeah. <clears throat> So I, I, I tend to agree to, to a degree. I mean, I mean, we, and we've seen it before actually. When in 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 Europe, when Solvency Two was implemented, um, all the actuaries went over here to look at Solvency Two. And and while we were doing that, this whole data science thing sort of emerged. And um, and while we were looking over here, we sort of missed a trick a bit. And and I think there's a risk that the same could happen again with climate if we're not careful. So while all our actuaries are looking over here at IFRS 17. This whole climate thing's happening and, and other as i said earlier other people are potentially moving in so we do need to it's really important that we, we make sure we learn from that mistake before we make sure that doesn't happen again but it is a real challenge because because you do need actuaries to, to to look to get involved in ifrs 17 but we need to try and strike the right balance so that that, that, that it's it's um we, we do what we need to do but we we don't lose sight of the longer term thing and i think the longer term uh, play is on climate is my view <clears throat> yes uh, thanks for that matt yes um i think that brings us to a wrap i know it was a pretty ambitious plan to have you uh, address those tough topics in in seven to nine minutes and i thank you this conversation is going to continue and we want to be included we want to understand um how um we can support our membership um, on these topics. So we, we would love to reach out to you um, during the year to see how potentially we can work together. Um, so thank you very much for your time and participation and being with us. We do have a few reminders. Um, we have the social events coming up every evening. We are also inviting you to follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram. And I forgot the last reminder. I think it's on the slide, Kevin. Um, but with that, I think um, I just want to say thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, bye -bye. for inviting us once again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.